Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. Well, this week we wrap up our accidental trilogy of summer-themed pay-per-views in which Jesse Ventura plays a huge role. It's WWF SummerSlam 1999 from August 22nd at the Target Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. This one was nominated by Antoine Daniels over on Patreon. Antoine, thank you so much for your nomination. Like I mentioned, this show does heavily involve Jesse Ventura. He is the main attraction really of the main event. He's the special guest referee. He was elected governor of Minnesota the previous year. This is his first official year in office. So this was a big publicity get. Quite a coup for the company to acquire Ventura for this show, especially considering the history and the bad blood that the World Wrestling Federation and Jesse Ventura have had for years and years. Of course, uh, Ventura successfully sued the company in 1994 over video royalties. And of course, no, Vince doesn't like it in beat in court or really any kind of avenue. So for them to reconcile and realize what a good business move this would be for both sides, really, I think is a, is a testament to, you know, the McMahon's willingness to, to do business, let bygones be bygones. Also, I learned, you know, Jesse Ventura said in a shoot interview years later, one of the reasons he took this gig was to stick it in particular to Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan. He felt that uh, Bischoff betrayed him in WCW. And then, of course, a lot of bad blood between Hogan and Ventura going all the way back to the 80s when and Hogan had pretty much tattled on Ventura, who was trying to start a wrestler's union back during that time. So, you know, just more reason for Ventura to gain more from this and the exposure of being part of this big spectacle. 19,404 people pat the Target Center on this night. 600,000 pay-per-view buys is the number that I was able to find. Surprisingly, down 100,000 from SummerSlam 1998, Highway to Hell with Austin and Taker. Hmm. Anyway, Jim Ross and the Mayor King, Jerry Lawler, are on commentary here. Of course, this is in the thick of one of Jerry Lawler's mayoral campaigns, one of his failed mayoral campaigns. He figured if Jesse Ventura could win the governorship of Minnesota, then hey, maybe Jerry could, have, could possibly become mayor of Memphis. That did not happen. Anyway, what a strange set this is. I have to point this out. It's just a bunch of giant floodlights atop rows of cherry pickers, and that's pretty much it. There's like a screen atop all that, but yeah, very bare bones, minimalist set, kind of a weird vibe they're going for with the cherry pickers, I thought. Before the action kicks off, we get a backstage segment where Jesse Ventura is laying down the law to Triple H in China. The pinfall will take place in the middle of the ring. Jesse Ventura clearly wants this rule to be known because he says that a lot throughout the course of the evening. We then go to another backstage bit where Chris Jericho, who debuted for the company three weeks prior, is impatiently waiting for Howard Finkel to show up with his bags. Why he has bags, I have no idea because Jericho's not wrestling tonight. But anyway, Finkel has become kind of Jericho's lackey. I think what they were trying to do with Finkel, with Jericho for the first few weeks of, the, of his run, uh, maybe they were trying to recreate some of like the, the chemistry that Jericho and Ralph has had in WCW but I think that's giving them too much credit because of course WWF would never try and copy the competition's ideas wink. Opening matches for both the European and the Intercontinental titles as double champion D'Lo Brown defends against Jeff Jarrett. This is a rematch from the previous month on Raw when D'Lo, who was already the European champion, upset Jeff Jarrett in a title for title matchup to become the first ever Eurocontinental champion so big history here by D'Lo. He's defending both belts tonight against Jarrett. Uh, Jarrett and Deborah, who's coming out with Jeff, they get into an argument. He sends Deborah to the back. How dare you try and show off those puppies to everyone? You get back there, uh, Deborah. Jerry Lawler is just devastated. The fans are chanting asshole at him. This is just like, this is probably one of Jarrett's best runs here in the company when he had Deborah with him. And just the, the combination of what Jarrett was working with, with Deborah at ringside, combined with the climate of the company and the audience and everything in the demographic, this made Jarrett, I think, one of the most attested heels of all time because he refuse to let people see the puppies. But then out comes D'Lo Brown, who comes out with Deborah to a massive ovation. D'Lo starts out strong with an impressive array of power moves. Every time the camera cuts to Deborah during this match, Jerry Lawler, I think he ejaculates a little bit. D'Lo Brown really taking it to Jared here offensively. Oh. An athlete at one time is really oh. documented. There was a really neat cutoff by Jared here. At one point, D'Lo jumps off the second rope and Jared just catches him midair with a backdrop and just drops him in one fell swoop. Really cool move. I haven't seen that done before. I really pop for that move there. It's all Jarrett for uh, several minutes here. At one point, he hits a, a single arm DDT off the second rope. And I, again, I pop for that one as well because that was a move that uh, I did a little bit when I wrestled as well. It was one of my few offensive maneuvers. And so to see Jarrett do it as well, I, mwah, I love seeing that. A very loud We Want Puppies chant by the audience. D'Lo hits the running power bomb, goes for a big somersault off the top rope, but Jarrett is able to move. Jarrett has the guitar and looks to be, he's like threatening Deborah, who's, uh, who's on the apron here. Meanwhile, in comes Mark Henry dressed in his best 
best polo shirt and slacks to break up the action. He takes the guitar away from Jarrett, and uh, then all of a sudden when the referee's back is turned, he clobbers D'Lo with it. He betrays his best friend here in this championship matchup. I think it's so funny, the whole idea of Mark betraying D'Lo Brown, because at this point, Mark was like, he was, the whole the whole storyline was he was out of shape, and D'Lo, who had lost a ton of weight at that time, was trying to get Mark into shape. He was making him eat right, making him exercise more. So Mark basically was tired of exercising and tired of eating right, so he turned on D'Lo Brown and helped Jarrett win some titles. Man, that's weird. Jarrett makes the cover, pins D'Lo to become the second ever Eurocontinental champion, and then Jarrett and Henry and Debra are all smiles. It was a setup. It was collusion the whole time just to steal the belts from D'Lo. Uh, then the next night, so like I said, Jarrett was the second ever Eurocontinental champion, but he would hold the belt, the European belt, only for one night. The next night on Raw, he would award the European championship to Mark Henry, and then that would begin this feud between Brown and Henry, which pretty much wrapped up the next month on Unforgiven. D'Lo would win the title right back from Mark, and so that was really, that was Mark's only singles championship for almost a decade, and he didn't even win the belt. It was handed to him, and he wouldn't have another championship until 2008 when he won the ECW championship and then later to become the world heavyweight champion. Tag team turmoil match, a gauntlet where the winner will become the number one contenders for the tag team championships. The first two teams are two very intertwined teams in the history of the company. You've got the Hardy Boys, who actually at this point were called the New Brood, having just dumped Michael Hayes as their manager and now alongside with Gangrel, going against Edge and Christian, who just left the original Brood, just left Gangrel to do their own thing as a, as a tag team, a babyface tag team on their own. So this is a very interesting point in the careers of both teams. We're still a couple of months out from No Mercy that same year when they would set the world on fire with their uh, tag team ladder match. Not quite there yet in terms of personality and what they could do in the ring, but we do get some moments of brilliance here between both teams. Jeff with some high-flying maneuvers, as is his MO at the time. He hits a great springboard moonsault on the Christian. Then later he hits the Swanton on Christian, just kind of as a throwaway move. It was not called the Swanton on then. It certainly was not his finisher. He hits it and it's broken up. So it tells you how much stake was really put into that move at the time. There's this crazy move on the outside that I totally forgot ever happened and I don't think it's ever been done again where you've got Matt whipping. They're both, both all four guys on the outside. Matt has Edge. Christian has Jeff. Uh, Matt and Christian whip their respective guys into the same direction. Uh, Jeff and Edge jump onto the railings, opposite railings, run toward each other and then Edge hits a spear in the midpoint on the ramp. It's not a great connection but the fact they were able to do that move at all <laughs> really is like is amazing I was like whoa what a crazy move I would love to see that happen again sometime but it's just like a move they just pulled out of nowhere and the, the fans didn't know how to react to it they got no reaction compared to like when they like then played to the fans after doing it the, then the fans lit up for it but they didn't know what to make about that move Edge drops Matt with the electric chair then Christian with a top rope elbow drop and the Hardys are eliminated up next Midian and Viscera formerly of the Ministry of Darkness Viscera gets the jump on Christian right away JR cannot help himself. He just keeps ogling the size of Viscera multiple times on commentary. Look at the size of... Oh my God! Look at the size of Viscera. Kind of a short portion of the match here. Edge and Christian are able to outsmart Midian and Viscera. They knock Viscera out of the ring and Edge spears Midian to go on in the gauntlet match. Up next, Draws and Prince Albert. Uh, Draws, of course, was known as Puke at the time and Albert is currently the head trainer in NXT in the Performance Center. So he's had quite a lengthy career, hasn't he? Another relatively short chapter in the match. Uh, Christian and Draws fight on the outside for a bit. Albert has Edge up in a military press, but Christian with the chop block, a flatliner to Albert. That's not a move he ever did. He didn't do much longer after this. And then Draws and Albert are eliminated. Up next come the Acolytes. They show up right away and Brad, Sean, and Farouk just start beating the hell out of Edge and Christian. There's just some amazing banter between JR and King Aaron commentary where like JR brings up the, up the collegiate accolades of Brad, Sean, and Farouk. I know it was, like, it was the previous team. They were talking about Draws's football career and King's like, no one cares about that, JR. And then like they just go back and forth about it and JR goes well why don't you talk about your mayoral campaign but nobody cares about that either Ooh, sick burn three points from downtown as this part of the match goes on the final team in the gauntlet the Holly Cousins Hardcore and Crash who just debuted less than two weeks ago on TV they're running down but the match isn't over yet I don't know if they jumped the gun like intentionally or it was a botch where they thought that was the move they were supposed to run in on or not but anyway the match eventually does end when Bradshaw hits uh, Christian with the clothesline from hell the Hollies do run in and the match continues from there Farouk hits the dominator on Crash which I believe was one of the only six or seven times Farouk actually ever hit that move. Uh, Bob does a blind tag and Crash doesn't see it. So he hits Farouk with the clothesline. Crash goes for a cover, but Bob pulls him off and they fight for a bit. That was their whole thing for the first several months of their run was they were, they were fighting Holly Cousins. So Bob ejects 
crash from the ring. But then Bob eats a spine buster from Farouk. Farouk and Bradshaw win the gauntlet match. They will go on to face the tag team champions the following night on Raw. I give this one two and a half stars. It's a really good tag team match with a lot of strong points. The beginning stuff with Edge and Christian of the Hardys was a very strong opening salvo. Then Edge and Christian's run through the middle. It was you know a lot of short bursts, pretty short chapters, but they were still very entertaining in their own way. Then wrapping up with the Acolytes and the Hollies and stuff in there, kind of entertaining finish. So I think it was a very strong matchup. After we see Al Snow comforting his dog Pepper backstage, we go to another dog, the D-O-double-G. The road dog makes his way to the ring. He's not booked and he's dressed to kill, folks. He complains about he's not booked for the Hardcore Championship tonight, but he says he will challenge the winner the next night on Raw. Out comes Chris Jericho to interrupt. I forgot how long and drawn out they made his intro at first when he first debuted because it was the countdown. Then there's the silence. Then there was this, like, ethereal music they play. Then the pyro. Then the break the walls town. So Jericho comes out and he makes his is actually his first appearance on a WWF pay-per-view so it's his pay-per-view debut here at SummerSlam he's atop the lion's den which is super fitting for the lion heart Jericho calls the show summer scam he berates the fans for looking like fools for spending their money and being con to come to the show I guess you could say he was calling them a bunch of stupid idiots then he runs down road dog and DX he says you think you can impress people by spelling your name well here's how you can impress me spell lugubrious and he keeps running down road dog and then road dog with the comeback of the century where he just goes why don't you shut up, bitch? <laughs> then he tells Jericho to suck it, and I guess he wins the promo off based on that exchange. Okay, so then uh, Road Dog joins JR and King for the next match. And now it's time for a rematch from last month's pay-per-view as the big boss man defends his hardcore championship against the former champ, Al Snow. If you remember my fully loaded 99 review from way back, you know that boss man beat Al Snow for the championship by handcuffing him to a gate and pinning him against it to win the belt. At this point, Al Snow's mind was in total disarray. He was losing sleep. He was going just crazy because of course, Head had the railroad spike driven through it and he was just going crazy. He was hearing screaming all the time. But at this point now, Al is doing better he has a shoe head and now his new corner man is Pepper the Chihuahua but he leaves Pepper in a kennel backstage because he doesn't want him to get hurt or whatever so we have the match here uh, Snow starts off by in his entrance he just climbs up one of the cherry pickers and hides waiting for boss man to come out he dives off the cherry picker and the match begins in earnest so then Road Dog, who was sitting at the at the commentary table with JR and King for all of like 60 seconds gets up and grabs a microphone and starts going down and following them to do running commentary while the match is going on around him and like like, as soon as they walk to the back, you hear you hear something happen. You don't see what it is, but you hear Road Dog go, that was fake. Like, great, great job. Great work there, Rody. Uh, they fight their way to the kennel area backstage, where the kennel was. Pepper is clearly no longer in there, but I think the announcers either act like it is in there, or they just get confused, because the uh, kennel gets knocked around. There, oh my god, this dog's in there. Oh, the boss man just threw it across the arena. But no, there was no dog in there. The dog, there, was, there was no dog at risk. No dogs were harmed in the making of this spot here. Uh, Road Dog adds really nothing to this matchup he just he says a few words at a time with really just terrible roaming commentary maybe i'm the lucky one that i'm not in this match can you stay in between me and them i'll set boy's heart he's hobbling Alan Bossman fight their way through the backstage using a chalkboard, a big soda case. They fight their way outside the arena, into the street, across the street, into a nearby bar. And it feels like I'm playing No Mercy all of a sudden because we get transported into the bar scene after some backstage fighting. A uh, road dog lets everyone know they're in a bar by saying, we're in the bar. King, we're in the bar. A fan in the bar just hands Al Snow this chain that he had on him. What he was doing with that chain, I have no idea. What he was planning to do with the chain, was he thinking about, was he just predicting a match was going to happen in there? He just wanted to be prepared. Paired, uh, the mind boggles. Uh, Al knocks out Bossman with the chain. He chokes him out on the table. A big moonsault off the bar and through the table. Bossman is somehow able to get up first, though. You can see he's bleeding. Road Dog with his line of the night saying, That beer bottle did a little number on Big Boss Man's noodle, said D-O-Double-G the Poodle. No! D-O-Double-G the Poodle gets a little too close to the boss man who shoves him away. And then when Boss Man's back is turned, the Road Dog who grabbed uh, the nightstick from the rampway at the very beginning of the match clocks Boss Man in the back with it. And then Al Snow hits Boss Man in the ball with some billiard balls, pins him, and wins back his championship. Al Snow makes his victory run back to the arena, as was the tradition at the time. But all of a sudden, he runs by Blue Meanie and Stevie Richards, who are, like, trying to jumpstart a car with, like, jumper cables, and they also have Pepper. Like, Blue Meanie's wearing big black rubber gloves, and he's carrying Pepper somewhere. Like, and so Snow beats up the two of them, and also this bystander took the crutch from. And then the whole thing ends. But what was the BWO doing with Pepper? It was never really explained, because, like, it's never acknowledged on commentary. Uh, and then in the next match, you hear Jerry Lawler 
Pepper $1 give an update to fans. Don't worry, folks, Pepper was not in the kennel got thrown around, but no one explains what the hell Meanie and Stevie were doing with Pepper. And so it, it never really addressed. Well, later on, however, the boss man would kidnap Pepper, and that would lead to uh, him making Al Snow eat Pepper, the Pepper steak. That's a classic Attitude Era moment that led to the infamous Kennel from Hell match at Unforgiven, which is better left unsaid. Maybe one day I'll cover Unforgiven 99. We'll talk about that in more detail. But that was uh, this is where that whole thing led off to. But I'm going to give this one two stars out of four. It's one of the more entertaining hardcore matches of this era, really checking all the boxes of things you, you, know, you did back then during the hardcore matches. Road Dog was funny at times, but not like, I think it was just one of those kind of like cringeworthy funny things, but ultimately his involvement, except for the finish, was kind of pointless. Backstage, Ventura confers with Mankind, the three count's gonna be in the middle of the ring. Got it. And then uh, Mankind and Ventura take a shot at Geraldine Ferraro, former U.S. Senate candidate out of New York, because yeah, the fans care about politics right now, that's what they want to see. Don't you think that Geraldine Ferraro was vastly underrated as a candidate? She might have been, but she's a bleeding heart liberal, you know, come on. <laughs> Up next, the women's championship on the line as Ivory defends against Tori. No, not Tori Wilson, but this is the same Tori who debuted around WrestleMania 15 time as like a super fan of Sable. Different Tori here. Uh, two weeks earlier, Ivory had assaulted Tori and in the ring wrote the words slut and skank all over her body. Oh, Attitude Era. Uh, this match is really, really, really hard to watch. This is just a awful match. This is not like, it's not like some like brawn panties cat like kind of thing between two untrained women. These are two women who are trained to wrestle. Ivory obviously has more experience than Tori at this point, but it is not a good match. Tori is very stiff and almost immobile compared to Ivory, who's just trying to work around her and trying to get things to look good and work well, but nothing's working. This match is so hard to watch. At one point, Ivory yells, get ready for the big swing! Get ready for the big swing! Tori clumsily gets thrown into the corner and then bounces out with a spear. Tori with like a big alley -oop move, which never, almost never looks good, but it probably was one of the better moves she did of the whole time. It still wasn't that great. Tori hits a sunset flip, and then Ivory just gets right back up, and then they redo the spot, the sunset flip again, and this time, Ivory just like sits on her. Oh, they fucked up the finish. Like, Tori went down and threw with it as if it was a pinfall and didn't let Ivory sit on her to block it. So they just did the spot over again after they fucked it up. And so Ivory sits on her, covers her, almost kind of like a, a sting on Jeff Hardy kind of cover where she's putting all her weight down there. Like, don't you get the fuck up. So Ivory wins the match, retains the championship. This match sucked. I give it a half star out of four. And boy, it was like one or two boxes away from me giving it the, the ultimate zero star rating, folks. Ivory tried her best, and Tori did not look good here, and in doing so made both women look bad. Again, this is not like a cat fight match. This was supposed to be a straight up like women's wrestling match between two, you know, ostensibly trained women, and this just match did not work out. After the match, uh, Ivory tries to disrobe Tori, and out comes Luna. She makes her way out of the ring, makes a save, and chases Ivory off. This was Luna's return to the company after a six month suspension that she got after fighting Sable backstage at a show. This is her big comeback. She had a brief feud with Ivory over the championship after this, but was unsuccessful in winning it, and then she would go on to manage Gangrel in the months that followed. Of course, Gangrel was Luna's real-life husband at the time. Backstage, The Rock is being interviewed by Michael Cole, but then The Rock turns it around on him, grabs the microphone, and tries to interview Cole instead, and asks him, you know, you look at The Rock, I see the way you look at The Rock, are you Kumsi Kumsa? Then he gives a rundown of what's going to happen in his match with Billy Gunn later in the night, and he is surprisingly accurate with how things are going to turn out. Next match is a Lion's Den weapons match as Ken Shamrock fights Steve Blackman. Of course, the Lion's Den match, kind of a much maligned, often forgotten part of Attitude Era history. It debuted as a match type the previous year at SummerSlam 98 when Shamrock fought Owen heart one-on-one, -on -one. Uh, but these guys here, Shamrock and Blackman, have been feuding for quite a while, a few months now. They had their big uh, Iron Circle match the month before it fully loaded, with Shamrock won. Then, uh, in the weeks that followed, Blackman hit Ken with a car backstage. More internal injuries, the whole bleed, spitting out blood, that was kind of Shamrock's gimmick for a while, at that point was spitting out blood. Shamrock issues the challenge for a Lion's Den match, it's his domain, but Blackman selects the weapons of choice that are uh, around the top of the cage here. There's no, they say here, no pinfalls, no submissions, you have to to leave the cage 
to win, and we'll see how that actually plays out when the match actually happens. Blackman pulls out a pair of nunchucks he had hidden in his pants as Shamrock was making his entrance. He gets a few shots in, but ultimately Shamrock gets the chucks away from Blackman. They fight over it for a couple more minutes, then uh, Shamrock just throws the nunchucks away. He doesn't need weapons until moments later when he grabs a weapon. He goes for a kendo stick, but Blackman's able to block the shot with his arms and regain the advantage. Both men are throwing each other into the cage walls here. Then Blackman grabs the beaten sticks. I don't know what the official name for these sticks are, but when I was a kid watching this stuff, I just called them the beaten sticks, and so that's my official name for him. Anyway, Blackman chokes Ken with one of the sticks. He whips Ken into the wall, but then Ken does a sweet, some parkour shit. A, uh, jumps off the wall and hits Steve with a flying forearm. Blackman grabs another kendo stick and just whoops Ken with it, cracks him right in the head with it. You can hear the crack and hear see it bounce off his head. What a gnarly looking shot that was by Blackman. Uh, Blackman goes to the door, but the referee's not opening it. And I'm not sure, based on the body language the referee was giving, I thought he was just saying, no, I'm not going to open this door. But the commentary says, well, maybe Steve's telling him not to open the door so he can lay more damage on Ken Shamrock. Okay, I don't know what the actual story, the true story of this is, but either way, Blackman's not getting out. Anyway, Shamrock with a comeback, he beats Blackman with a stick, his own head shot. He stands there for a bit. Blackman's just laid out. He's, he's out of the match. Uh, he just, so Shamrock just stands there, looks around. The bell rings. Shamrock has not left the ring yet, but then he climbs up the top and then he poses for a bit. It's a very similar ending to Iron Circle the previous month where it's like he wins the match even though he didn't leave the Iron Circle which was the objective that they specifically said <laughs> on commentary so again they don't quite do what they say they're going to do here but Shamrock decisively wins here. I, I feel bad because in theory I love the Lion's Den match it's such a unique concept you never see something like this. I mean it's basically their, it was their answer to the Octagon back then that's all that was um, but at the time it was still for, for wrestling it was still kind of unique and I wish they did more with it, but they never really got, and I said this before my fully loaded review, I wish they did more with the Lion's Den stuff, but you look at a match like this, and it's like it really handcuffs you, because depending on your, your level of workmanship, because all these guys did was weapon shots and like running into the walls. It was very one-dimensional. They really couldn't get into a second gear with no ropes and no ring out. They really couldn't tell a story. It was supposed to be kind of a bare-knuckle street fight kind of thing, and I think you can do that, but I didn't quite feel it with these guys here. It's the Greenwich Street Fight, a.k.a. the Love Her or Leave Her match as Test goes against Shane McMahon. The whole crux of this storyline is Test and Stephanie McMahon, who debuted this, earlier this year uh, as a character, have started dating in kayfabe. And Shane McMahon wants nothing to do with that. He doesn't want his, his lovely sister to date a wrestler. Ugh. He actually said, ew, I hate Test, as a result of what's going on here. So this match here is going to determine whether or not Test and Stephanie will continue to date. If Shane wins, then Test and Stephanie must break up and go their separate ways, but if Test wins, then Shane must bow out and just butt out of their lives, their personal affairs, forever, it seems. So, early in the night, Shane jumped Test and worked over the injured ribs that had been previously injured a week or two beforehand. And in the past weeks, Test had been trying to even the odds, because of course the Mean Street Posse were a big thing around this time, so Test, one by one, was beating up the Posse. Uh, it's very similar to me when, when Randy Orton, years later, would beat up the Nexus one by one on his way to fighting CM Punk at WrestleMania. The stakes are a little bit different, but you get my idea here. Before the match begins here, out come the posse, wearing Hawaiian shirts, looking very injured. Rodney's got his arm in a sling. Pete Gass is wearing a neck brace. Joey Ab's wearing a boot. <laughs> and they're all, they're all smiles, though, happy to see Shane after they got beat up. And they have this, like, front row area cornered off of them at ringside. It's like a couch, and there's a lamp there for some reason. It's a fully lit house. What do you need a lamp there for? And they also have, like, champagne and everything. So they're there to enjoy the thing. The action starts off fast and furious in the outside. They make their way to the ring for a couple of seconds before making their way back out to the ring. Shane dives off the barricade, but Test catches him and power slams him on the floor, then throws Shane into the posse with a, with a military press. The posse start beating on Test once they get close, and they start feeding Shane weapons, including a mailbox that has the words Mean Street Posse number one dollar sign on it. So he hits Test with that. And then there's a framed photo of Shane and the posse that Shane hits Test over the head with embracing a million pieces. Better than the framed Scott Hall picture from the San Francisco 49ers match in WCW. Shane tries going for a corkscrew moonsault on the test but misses. What other kind of moves was Shane working on in practice before ultimately settling on corkscrew moonsault? Like, you think all the crazy stuff that he's done before in his career and that was not really talked about much. Of all the other crazy shit, the corkscrew moonsault I would never expect him to hit. Test power bombs Shane after a leapfrog attempt but the referee is distracted can't make the count. Shane dodges a big boot and Test just flattens the referee with it. Test makes a comeback but the posse gets back into it. Triple teaming Test. They place him on the Spanish announce table 
And then Shane, well, I believe this is his first time he ever did the giant elbow drop from the top rope onto the table. Look at all them flash bulbs he's soaring through the sky. I love it. Test kicks out after the dragon back into the ring. The posse just repeatedly keeps trying to screw Test out of the match, but Test keeps kicking out. I love JR's call here. The love that Test has for Stephanie is immeasurable. I love the commentary here because it's adding this whole element of like love and like fighting for what you believe in into this, this, this street fight here. I love it. The Stooges, Patterson and Briscoe, who we haven't seen in quite some time, make the save and beat up the posse to even the odds. Test is the pump handle slam on his chain. Big elbow drop from almost three quarters of the way across for Test to win and all out comes Stephanie McMahon. She's happy. She's hooping and hollering. She runs in and she hugs Test. All oh, true love prevails after all. I'm going to give it three stars out of four. A very entertaining bro the sleeper hit of the night here just bouncing back between like comedic stuff and great spots and great action and drama this is a great story here this whole i mean i loved when i was a kid watching this i loved the test and stephanie storyline and what they were working here the the, the 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 story they had here and all the opposition they had in the, in the face of their love for each other it was a beautiful story of course then like test and stephanie would continue to date in kayfabe test would propose to stephanie then stephanie would briefly have amnesia for a bit that's a whole other thing and then they would be engaged and they were about to get married and triple h interrupts it and it reveals that he married stephanie the night before in las vegas that's a whole other thing i think we all know where that ended up tag team belts on the line as kane and x-pac defend against the undertaker and the big show now taker and show recently had formed an unholy alliance as it were where taker was training big show to be evil and nasty. It was not a friendly relationship that these two had. It was a very tenuous relationship of like master and student at the very best. This meant we got some tacky Undertaker promos and I, you know, including the infamous snake neck ties and lizard boots promo from the week before this actually. Uh, go to my awesomely bad promos countdown if you want to hear more about how awful that was. Meanwhile, X-Pac and Kane have been kind of like the feel-good story of the year. They formed an unlikely bond and friendship. X-Pac has taught Kane to be human and have more compassion passion and humanity. Kang said his first words without the assistance of that little voice box gimmick. He said, so good. And he got a huge pop. God, I love this storyline. The X-Pac Kane storyline was amazing. It was one of the better things of the Attitude Era to me as a teenager watching this. It was awesome. Kane's debuting the new inverted colors of tonight with the red on black. And good lord, Paul Bear looks just huge here. This is before he'd been taken off TV to do some of the, 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 do the lap band surgery where he'd drop a lot of weight. But this is him at his biggest here. This is like him at WrestleMania 2000, like Paul Bear in the video game, that's what they base this off of. It was not a good look for Bear here. They immediately, the two of them, Show and Taker, focus their attack on X-Pac. And on the outside, Taker goes for a chokeslam on the floor, uh, but Kane pulls, he grabs him, he intercepts him, and pulls him back into the ring to safety, which I thought was pretty cool. Kane begins to get worked over by Show and Taker. We get a double down between Kane and Undertaker. Kane tags in X-Pac and looks good against Taker for a moment until Show drops him on the barricade and tosses him back into the ring. Taker drives Pac crotch first into the turnbuckle post and uh, then X-Pac gets bear hugged by the Big Show. The most devastating bear hug in our business, Jim Ross says. Someone tell Bruno San Martino that. X-Pac takes Big Show and Taker to low blow and dick kick city respectively before tagging in Kane for the hot tag. X-Pac hits the Bronco Buster on show who totally no sells it and choke slams X-Pac but he goes for a very nonchalant early Chris Jericho-esque one foot cover. X-Pac kicks out of it. Taker's furious. He gets tagged in. Beats up X-Pac some more tombstone and that's the match the unholy alliance wins and takers pissed at show for his lackadaisical pin there it was a very good tag team match good story told with x-pac more than holding his own alongside and against three really big dudes and being able to hold his own and still look strong even though he's getting beat up of course he and kane would go on to win the belts a second time later in the year but that's for another time backstage jesse ventura tells austin middle of the ring Three count, taking place. Austin just walks off, doesn't let Jesse finish his sentence. I don't blame him. We've heard it twice before already. We don't need to hear it a third time. It's the first ever Kiss My Ass match as The Rock takes on the 1999 King of the Ring winner, Billy Gunn. Let's just get this out of the way here. Uh, this match is a foregone conclusion, and it all stems back to this promo that The Rock cut a few weeks earlier on Sunday Night Heat. Sunday Night Heat, not even Raw at this point. Uh, Rock's cut a promo on Billy Gunn where he basically reenacts a hypothetical conversation between Billy Gunn and God in the midst of prayer and totally eviscerates Billy Gunn. Now, The Rock has been known for totally burying his opponents on in promos before, but for some reason, it never felt as bad 
or as one-sided or as uncontested as this promo here because Gunn never really got a word in edgewise after the fact. Go, if you haven't seen this promo, go watch it because it's, it's very iconic. It's one of The Rock's like, stronger, more memorable promos. Uh, but yeah, Billy Gunn, I don't think ever recovered from this. It made him look like a chump. Again, more so than other people that Rock has buried in, in promos and stuff. Um, you know, maybe it's because this time God was invoked and so that's kind of the ultimate, like, that's the kill move to invoke God in the promo and, and bury your guy. But this just seemed to be known as a turning point where Gunn was never taken seriously again, despite being given the singles push as King of the Ring winner. Anyway, Billy makes his way to the ring, accompanied by some figure under a big black sheet. Jim Cornette said it best, if they come out from a cake or under a sheet, it's a surefire way to get over. Billy gets on the mic and says, it's not my ass he's kissing if I win tonight, it's hers. Pulls back the sheet and it's a random big lady. Oh, the ultimate humiliation, having to kiss the posterior of this random, big, unattractive woman. Uh, you know, first of all, again, foregone conclusion, The Rock's getting nowhere near that posterior. It's all Billy Gunn. He's taking the bullet in this one. Second of all, like, the entire span of this matchup, the announcers are just tearing into this woman about her looks and, like, her weight and, like, oh, she smells. It's like, you know, it's mostly Jerry Lawler doing this, but JR is kind of going along with it. And I'm not, I'm not going to get into a rant about body shaming. I'm not, that's not what I'm here to talk about. But could you focus on the match, at least? And a match they have. Rock and Gun fight their way up to the stage area, up against the crowd looking on, each man taking some hard bumps on the exposed concrete. The Lion's Den makes a cameo appearance as well. Back toward the ring, Gun knocks the Rock out with the ring bell. I'm guessing it's a no DQ match because the referee's letting a lot of stuff go here in this contest. You know, not for nothing. You know, Gunn's push may have died when Rock cut that promo about Billy Gunn talking to God, but Gunn does look good in this match. He gets a lot of really good offense here against the Great One. Hits the Famouser after some good back and forth. He tells the woman to get into the ring. She hikes up her britches. She got tear in her, her, her nylons or whatever. It's big. oh my God. So Billy Gunn goes to throw Rock in head first, but the Rock blocks it and counters, shoves Billy Gunn's face into the woman's butt. And JR honestly has one of the biggest calls of his career. You can have your as God as my witness, he's broken in half, but to me, nothing's gonna top this. The Rock just put Billy Gunn's face in that large woman's ass. The Rock called it in the back. Rock bottom, people's elbow, Rocky, Rocky. The Rock wins the match. Was there ever any doubt? I'm gonna give this match two stars out of four, be that as it may. It was still a good basic matchup here with some entertaining moments. Uh, you know, again, four dark conclusion, but at least the match itself, the, 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 the story they told to get there was still entertaining. Time now for the main event, a triple threat match for the WWF Championship as Steve Austin defends against Triple H and Mankind. How do we get here? Blew, got me. This is a very confusing road we have taken to get to this matchup here. And even back then I was confused. And now, years later, I'm still confused. Almost 20 years after the fact. Uh, anyway, it starts out, well, first of all, weeks before this, Jesse Ventura was announced as the, you know, he's going to be the guest referee for the championship match at SummerSlam, in particular, TBD. Uh, then you got a triple threat match signed between Austin, Triple H, and Undertaker. But during that night, Austin's taken out by a mystery assailant. And then Shawn Michaels comes out and makes it a number one contendership match, and the third person is now China. So then uh, China upsets both Triple H and Taker by winning the match uh, on the outside, actually. She becomes a number one contender, and so then the next week, Triple H, if, who's pissed by all this, he feels it's his time, it's his destiny to become the champion, and he beat the Rocket fully loaded, he has the momentum, this is his night, SummerSlam is his night. So he gets pissed, challenges China to a match, so they fight for the number one contendership, China wins in an upset once again, once Mankind has been out for three months or so, interferes and costs Triple H the match. So China still number one contender. Then the next week, you got Mankind versus China for the number one contendership, which then Mankind wins. And then you've got Mankind and Triple H to have a match to have the undisputed number one contender. And that match ends in a double pin. Blew, I'm exhausted just trying to recount all that stuff. And I think I think I got all the details right. But even now, I'm not so sure. Even though they talked about it a little bit in the opening hype package for the show itself, I was kind of surprised that the hype package for this particular match didn't in any way mention that Jesse Ventura was going to be the referee for this contest. I feel they also kind of missed out on a huge opportunity by when he was introduced to the ring, introduce him as the governor of Minnesota, and the name key at the bottom, introduce him as the governor, Jesse the Body of Ventura, something. Like, here you have, like, the leader of a state.
state. Like an elected leader controls the whole state of Minnesota, officiating your main event, and he used to be a wrestler, and he used to be a big deal, and you don't even like bring up the fact he's an elected official. Like this is a huge coup for this company. Fucking pump this up. The match starts off hot the moment Austin enters the ring, fighting inside and outside of the ring early on. Jesse is caught up trying to stay between China and Mankind, but while he's distracted, Triple H whacks Austin in the leg on the outside with a chair. Then Jesse pantomimes to the audience, did he hit him with a chair? Did he hit him with a chair? And the crowd's like, yeah, it's such an old school tactic that is never done today. I love that they did that there. Uh, China crotches Mankind in the corner post. Jesse catches it and then ejects China. Jesse the Pointer Ventura at it again, pointing at it. You get out of here, you. Triple H works Austin's leg, wraps it around the turnbuckle post. Triple H and Mankind take turns stomping Austin until the two of them do it together. The double teaming lasts for all 30 seconds before they're at it again. Mankind goes for a dive off the apron onto the floor. Triple H just moves and Foy just takes all of it on the floor. Ugh, I just got flashbacks to Beach Blast 92. But at least in this case, there was some padding this time. Austin with a stunner on Mankind, but Triple H hits Austin with a chair during the pin. Jesse yells, what's this bullshit? Triple H then hits Mankind in the head with a chair, goes for a cover, but Jesse will not let him win the match that way. Ooh, Ted DiBiase must have bribed him again. Shane McMahon then runs into the ring to admonish Ventura for his officiating. Austin hits Shane with a stunner, then Ventura throws Shane out of the ring and says, that was for your old man, you bastard. And then, but the thing is, they almost missed the best part of this match, in my opinion, because at that point when Jesse's leaning over the ropes and talking to Shane, Austin gets on the ropes as well, then he gets tangled up and just like rolls over and gets his legs caught in the ropes. You barely see it. Like, you have to have a very keen eye to see Austin's foot kind of sticking out in the shot. They do a good job covering it up as best they can until Triple H makes his way to the ring. Austin's like yelling at him, help, get me out of here. And so then Triple H goes and saves him, gets him out of the, the ropes, out of that predicament. So the match goes on. Austin with a stunner on Triple H, but Foley breaks up the pinfall. Triple H is the pedigree on Austin. Foley clocks Triple H, decks him, gets him out of the ring, hits Austin with a double arm DDT, and wins the match. I will always remember the reaction that this pinfall got. I vividly remember I watched this paper. I listened to this pay-per-view on scrambled pay-per-view when I was a kid watching it live. I heard the reaction. I saw it again here on the network. And I'm like, this is just a weird reaction because it's a positive response with the crowd, but it's not the outcome anyone predicted. I think it was everyone, everyone was expecting Austin or Triple H to win and they had, they were ready for that. But then when, when Foley wins, who's a baby face, but not the one they expected to win. So it's like, oh, what the, f okay, Foley won, yay. That's basically the vibe I got from hearing that pop from when they won. It was kind of, it was almost delayed. They didn't, the fans didn't know what to think when Foley won. That was the way I interpreted that response. I'm gonna give it three stars out of four. It was a really entertaining triple threat match. You know, the added attraction of Jesse Ventura's return of the company as a referee added to some of the spectacle as well. But even if you didn't have him involved, I think it was still a very, uh, very well booked triple threat match. I think it was told a great story. Also, fun fact, SummerSlam 99 is the first show in the company's history where the WWF, Intercontinental, and Tag titles all changed hands on a single night. They would do that the next time, a decade later, TLC 2009. Fun little factoid there. After the match, Triple H beats the hell out of Austin's leg with a chair. Austin's written out of action for quite some time until he comes back and basically is written off TV again, Survivor Series 99, when Austin, or rather a stunt double, is hit by a car and Austin's officially out of TV for a long time to get his neck surgery. So the next night on Raw, Triple H beat Mankind to become the new champion. It was his first time as a champion and it was Mankind's last run with the title in about 24 hours or so. So why did they go about doing this? Why, instead of having Triple H just win the belt at SummerSlam, which a lot of people thought would happen, did they do this whole roundabout thing with Austin dropping the belt to Mankind and then Mankind dropping it to Triple H the next night? There's a couple of different rumors around the same kind of vein about this. The main narrative that's been pushed for the last 20 years is that allegedly Austin played politics and didn't want to put over Triple H. And so Mankind was put in there at the last minute as a stopgap, making a triple threat. Um, and allegedly Shawn Michaels got in Triple H's ear, which pissed Austin off. Some variation of that kind of story has been passed around, been bandied about for a long time. But to my knowledge, no one has ever really been able to truly confirm that. So, you know, that's just kind of, you know, rumor and innuendo, as some might say. But depending on who you listen to, it's either Austin politics or the company just wanted to have like a double surprise in 24 hours where Mankind won Sunday, Triple H won Monday. Uh, so basically it's, it's one of those two camps, essentially, depending on, you know, who you want to believe. 
There was only one really bad match in the night, and that was Ivory and Tori. The Lion's Den match was just kind of a letdown for me. So I'm going to put it in that kind of con category as well. But there are other great matches. The Tag Team Turmoil match was great. Boss Man versus Snow was entertaining. Shane and Test was probably the match of the night. And the main event of Austin, Triple H, and Mankind was very strong. Uh, most of their matches in the card didn't stand out to me as much in terms of like match quality, but in terms of like storyline advancement, we did get a lot of that in spades with a lot of those other mid-card matches. Well, that's my review of SummerSlam 99. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks once again to Antoine Daniels for nominating this show on Patreon. If you want to play a role in determining which classic shows I review in the future, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate shows for me to review in this segment in the future. Well, one week after the release of this review, I'm going to be in Manchester, England for the Wrestling Media Con on September 8th and 9th, so I figured in two weeks' time for the next classic review, I should do something England-themed. Well, unfortunately, SummerSlam 92 has never been nominated on Patreon, so I'm going to go with the next best thing. Insurrection 2002. That was the only UK pay-per-view that I have nominated so far, so there you go. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.